So we are group one and we're trying to look at how public policy can be used to build inclusive communities uh, through levers of system change. Um, and before we go right straight into the presentation, I think it would be nice that we just give a quick introduction of ourselves. And so my name is Great Tudochi and my teammates are... Claudia Batts. Jessica Antonis. Norma Chris Ankala. And Rebecca Bassey. Um, yeah, and so uh, the problem really for us um, as a group was, you know, we're trying to figure out how to go about this. And so um, if the idea is to build inclusive communities using public policy, um, we decided to first ask ourselves, what's the problem with the way things are being done currently? Um, and so we figured out that the problem really is that not all societal groups are able to participate equally um, in, you know, the political, cultural and social life um, of the society. Um, and so we asked ourselves, um, ourselves as a collective, um, what are the causes of exclusion? And we came up with a framework that divided these causes into like a main cause, intermediate causes or intervening causes, and then the root cause. Um, and so for us, the main cause of exclusion, I mean, it's also important to issue a disclaimer that these causes are not fixed or these problems are not fixed. Um, and so some of them could overlap. And also, you know, it's not an exhaustive list in the sense that there could also be more causes or more problems um, regarding exclusion. And so for us, the main cause of exclusion is, you know, the fact that, you know, you have lack of systems thinking in the policy processes and, you know, what are the causes of this lack of systems thinking? Um, and so we came up with some suggestions, um, one of which is the idea that um, sometimes you have solutions that just deal with like the symptoms of the problems and not necessarily the root causes of the problems. And these solutions are sometimes, you know, implemented by NGOs or policymakers. Um, and, you know, they just look at the symptoms and not necessarily the root causes. Um, also the idea that you have gaps um, in institutional gaps in implementing certain policies um, and also inadequate communication mechanisms. Um, what some people call information asymmetry. And so the idea that sometimes you have policies in place, but you know, not everyone is aware of these policies. Certain groups are not aware that they have access to certain services because you know, the communication mechanisms are not clear enough. Um, and also the idea that you have limited engagement of you know, the different communities with lived experiences um, in the policymaking process. And so why is this a problem? You know, what causes all of this for us? Um, we came up with the isms. So here you go. <laughs> um, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, patriarchy, and the negative consequences of capitalism um, for us were the root causes of, of exclusion. And so I'd hand over to my teammate, Claudia, to go ahead with the approach. Thank you. Thank you, Gray. And um, before I think we go into the solution, I think it's really important to define what we mean by an inclusive community. And to us as a collective, a group, we agree that an inclusive community is one that values and serves the needs of all of its members. It promotes civic engagement and provides equal opportunities for the public, public participation and representation in decision-making processes. There is a culture in inclusive communities, there is a, a culture of belonging that it starts with acceptance, but also fosters cross-collaboration. Ultimately, though, and, and according to the, the UN Declaration of, on Human Rights, everyone in society has the right to and freedom of, um, to, of freedom of expression and opinion and should be able to contribute to society without fear of discrimination or exclusion. And we really believe that in, in addition to this, it's important to um, in an inclusive community to have that you know, openness and willingness to adopt new approaches that might be proposed by community members themselves. Now, we, we also set out to, um, you know, we wanted to outline some guiding principles for our work as we embarked on the project. And for us, you know, really, uh, as we talk about, you know, policies and, and communities, we really believe that communities have to be engaged throughout the whole policy cycle from the development, implementation, monitoring and evaluation to reporting. But also, you know, it's, we, must, we must acknowledge that it's actually the policy context that, that, that really kind of assesses the where there is potential for change. And, and we looked very much at the, at the, at the national level, but you know, what, what is the most appropriate for one country might not work well um, in another. Um, and building on that, you know, uh, we really hope and, 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 and would um, anticipate that there is coherence between national and 
international policies, but also that in recognizing that, you know, it is political and public law that will ultimately determine action. So um, the, the solutions that we're going to propose today are very much building on our collective experiences, but I'll hand over to Jen. Thank you. Uh, so I will talk a bit about our approach. First of all, what is the level that we are uh, addressing? We went for the national level because we think that then the context, but also the constituency and the mandates can be taken into account and we can give concrete recommendations. Um, also because we think that eventually uh, the national level will transcend into a global level. So an example would be when we do get it right on national level and we make policies that work better for more people, the international stances of those countries would eventually also be more inclusive. So on EU level, the voting would hopefully also represent more people. Uh, the second one uh, is on who should be involved, involved and who should adopt our recommendations. Since we are uh, thinking big and uh, in systems, we think that everyone needs to be involved and especially these uh, groups should be working together more. So we listed a couple such as governments, companies, and the NGOs, youth, um, but the list can go on and on. And then uh, going into our approach of system thinking. Uh, so what are the real root causes to this problem? And great, did a great job uh, telling us a bit about this. So keeping in mind uh, the structured inequalities and ideologies such as capitalism, sexism, racism, uh, and creating more inclusive policies by increasing cross collaboration uh, to build these inclusive communities and to better tackle these, these root causes. So let me hand over. Yes, so I would like to make it more personal to bring it back home. So I'd like to ask you to close your eyes, all of you. Just think, just quiet. Um, and imagine how we could build inclusive communities for our children 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, how we can make sure that they're not excluded in any shape or form, whether it's socially, economically, politically, that they also have a strong feeling of belonging where they are. I'd like you to open your eyes. It's a difficult sort of process, right? And thinking of how that could change. Um, and we came with our, an approach, a strategy of looking at it um, using pillars and thinking that we should um, reimagine how we educate and learn on all sectorial levels. So this is NGOs, think tanks, the government, individuals, learn about systemic biases within our education systems, moving on and also reframing leadership, who is leading, who has decision-making power, and also thinking about how we can um, have multi-stakeholder multi engagement and ensure that all these groups can work together and share information. And of course, for this to happen, we need funding, we need um, accountability and change management mechanisms. So I'll hand over to Rebecca to go deeper into what we mean. Sure, thank you. So as we could see here, these are the levers of change that we have decided upon. They all work together and they might be some overlap, but I'll just break them down individually for all of you. So our first area, reframing leadership. To us, reframing, uh, reframing leadership means decision-making power for marginalized, marginalized groups are extended and expanded upon what we describe. So experts are not just what we typically describe as experts. We rethink what that means to us. So we'll advise that we bring in um, um, external public officials to be there to advise, to bring their impartial advice to support us. And we also feel there's a need to have independent advisory boards, but not just advisory boards that are just there for the sake of it. We've seen that before. We want advisory boards that have voting rights, advisory boards that have elected representatives, advisory boards that truly know what they, they what it means to have lived experiences of being diverse groups or being marginalized groups. That's what's important to us. And that's what we mean by redefining leadership. The next area is education learning. This was one of the most important areas and something that I truly believe in. By this, we mean responsible strategic communications. How do we interact? How, we, 
how are we presenting these ideas and how are we ensuring that the learning within these organizations are not just what the dominant group are presenting, but truly what we believe. Um, some of our ideas include national D DEI policy standards. So we give guidance about what should be um, learned, what, what is diversity and inclusion. It needs to be a standard nationally and therefore we'll see it globally that um, we see change and better ideas. And another area is promoting inclusive curriculums. So that's not just in our governments, but in our NGOs. How do we become inclusive environments and how do we ensure that our education curriculums are um, reflective of who we're trying to represent? Our third area is funding. And this is really interesting. So we came up with the idea of having a global tax rate. And that idea is contingent on having inclusive policies. And through that, it ensures that big corporations are really paying towards <laughs> the people that are that they're representing and also people that are classed as marginalized or often excluded from policy. And another idea and what we see in our program is private public partnerships. So we want to encourage more of this to happen. Um, we see people like um, Walt Disney, Kellogg's, all these organizations like putting money towards projects like this. We want to see more of that and want to encourage that. Our fourth area is accountability and management. So that means monitoring and evaluation by independent groups. That is required by reporting to government departments and sharing that information. We want actual learnings from mistakes. We don't want to just do more policy and not learning from what we've done before. We need to get the information and transfer that to leadership. And we want the leadership to act upon that. And also within that, most importantly, is relationship management. We want to win hearts and minds. We need people to truly believe in what we're saying. It's not just forcing through our ideas, but we need to build those relationships, those long-term relationships that we'll see long-term change by what we're doing. And then finally is stakeholder engagement. And by this, we mean promoting international networks and platforms and to share resources, funding and expertise. So this could mean like having a mandated group that's um, advocating for education alliances. So they might have the expertise, they might have the funding and they will bring together grassroots organizations, bigger um, corporations together. So they are not um, working in silos, but they're working together, but also the information that they're getting is not staying just within those small organizations, but they're all working together and transferring that information to bigger departments as well. And also it provides them a space to also share their ideas internally. So these were some of the ideas that we came up with and we do think there's some overlap with them, but we're open to that. And back to Claudia. Yeah, and I guess just to wrap up and obviously I think you know, we, we've put out a lot of information there and it comes to show the complexity of the, the systems that we're living in. And I'm sure the different groups here today will, will delve into them in more detail. But if there are a few key messages that we'd like everyone online and in person to take from this, this conversation, it's that none of these elements in the system can, can function on its own, right? We need funding to um, support education and, and, and learning, but also um, to allow for constructive um, you know, alliances and in education, we need multi-stakeholder multi engagement, et cetera. And we believe that these practices need to be, we need to you know, build on existing practices and implement them across the board and, and, and scale them up in order to have impact. But also for us, you know, we already have, you know, we're, we're grateful to have a seat at the table, but it's about reframing who leads and, and, and shifting decision-making power to really, um, to, to really make that, that impact that we want to see. And, and lastly, um, I think, you know, fostering change and, and at the national level really has massive potential to influence action globally, but also trans transcend down to regional and local levels. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you.